So we're going to jump in. Um, so first off, this is uh, non-firing, obviously, since we're doing it on Facebook Live. But this is just a, a course on firearm safety, uh, kind of some of what is the industry standard, as well as my specific spin on things. Uh, my name is David Belmont, for those of you who don't know. I've been a firearms instructor for about four years now. Uh, I've been the president of a local gun club for about three, uh, served in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, where I did a little bit of instruction type stuff there, but to be entirely honest, uh, pretty much everything that I teach and what I think is best practice now is stuff that I've actually learned as a civilian, uh, deep diving into the world of guns. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, so first off, um, this video uh, was intended for folks who had just purchased a firearm, um, folks who had already had firearms. It's really intended for everyone. Um, but the reason I decided to do it was, is with everything going on, COVID-19, et cetera, um, I know there's been a lot of panic buys uh, that have happened. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're pro uh, practicing proper safety and, and you, know, you actually have the option to get out and uh, train a place to shoot safely, make sure you know what you're doing. Um, so whether you're a new firearm owner or you're someone who's already owned firearms, uh, an existing shooter, it's just good, never hurts to have a refresher on safety, and it's definitely something you want if you are new. Uh, another type of person that might be joining in as we do this is family members. Um, for example, if, if you shoot guns and you love guns, there's no such thing as too many of them to you. Uh, just be aware that your spouse might not feel that way, your kids might not be aware of the safety, and so it's gonna be, gonna be up to you to make sure they get the training uh, they need to be able to live in a home safely with firearms. Uh, it's all very important stuff when it comes to owning firearms. There's more to it than just picking up a firearm and shooting it. Um, another type of person that I hope might join in and get something useful from this, or if you're watching this video when we're not live, is shooters uh, or non-shooters who just might be interested in learning a little bit more. Maybe you're prepping and preparing to uh, purchase your first firearm, or maybe you just are interested in it and would like to know a little bit more. So it's kind of a little bit of everything for everyone. There may be some information in here you already know, uh, but my hope is, is that you walk away with something new at the end of the day. Uh, so our learning objectives. Um, obviously, first and foremost, we're going to go over just some universal firearm safety rules. Uh, there's a bunch of variations of these out there, but they basically all boil down to the same thing. So we'll cover those. Uh, we're going to cover personal protective equipment, PPE or safety gear. That's uh, a requirement for when you are shooting, handling firearms. Uh, we're also going to cover manual of arms. Uh, manual of arms traditionally meant that uh, you were talking about how to use a firearm, specific drills for the military, et cetera. Um, we've translated that a little bit into more of the civilian sector. So we expand a little bit beyond just drills that you would run, um, but it is very useful information. Um, it's something that I think goes hand in hand with safety. So we're going to go into that in more detail. Uh, we're also going to talk about firearm safety in practice, in reality. So whether that's in your home, whether you choose to conceal carry, um, carry a firearm in the vehicle, go to the range, etc. Basically, anytime you're around firearms, uh, we're going to talk about something beyond just shooting firearms. Um, that safety that is that lifestyle of having firearms in your life. Um, so a couple of the big points, obviously, we're going to touch on is firearms around children, how to properly store your firearms, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, just general use of firearms for self-defense. And last but not least, um, this is something that's very important to me. Uh, it's civic responsibility. Um, we're going to go into a little more depth, but in short, that's essentially it's your responsibility as someone who owns a firearm or who wants to own a firearm. It's your responsibility to make sure that you understand what the laws are, um, what the moral implications are, and what you need to be prepared for, both in training and mentality uh, that comes with owning a firearm. So it is a big responsibility. Uh, congratulations and welcome if you have already purchased a firearm. Um, and good for you if you haven't purchased a firearm yet and you're just trying to gather as much knowledge as you can before you actually go out and, and make that big jump. Um, so we're going to keep moving on here, but once again, if you did join, uh, just know that if you have any questions, anything like that, feel free to just drop a comment down. I'm going to do my best to answer them. If I have to go back a slide, that's not a problem. So. All right, so jumping in, uh, the universal four firearm safety rules, or firearms, uh, four firearm safety rules, they're also known as Cooper's Four, there's a bunch of other names. Uh, basically, these four rules are your holy grail of firearm safety. Um, they are designed in such a way with checks and balances that if at any time you slip up and you forget one of them, so long as you are all trying to practice all of them, if you miss one, you will still be safe. But the goal here is, is to follow all four of these. 
Um, so the first firearm safety rule is always treat every firearm as if it is loaded. Uh, so the reason that we as civilian firearms owners are concerned about this um, from just a personal ownership statement is the fact that firearms are inherently a tool with dangers. Um, you don't want to get into this idea that just because you confirmed the firearm is unloaded that you can now wave it around and do whatever you want with it. Um, if you build those habits, what will happen is, is you are inevitably setting yourself up for a situation where the firearm is not unloaded and if you treat it like it's unloaded, um, an accident is going to happen and someone is going to get hurt. So simply put, this first rule, always treat every firearm as if it's loaded, exists to put you in the right mindset. Anytime you are around firearms, anytime you are handling them, you need to treat them as if they have a, a live round in the chamber that could potentially hurt someone. So always treat every firearm as if it's loaded. Rule number two is never point your firearm at anything you are not willing to destroy. Um, this can also be phrased as anything you're not willing to shoot, anything you're not willing to have bullets impact, whatever it may be. Um, basically what happens is, I've actually got a firearm here in front of me. Um, so this is uh, a Glock 19, but there's a barrel right here that you guys can see. And when you pull the trigger on this thing, which is this thing right in here, the bullet's going to come out of the end and it's going to go in a straight line until either gravity pulls it down and it hits the ground or until it runs into something. So it's really important to pay attention to where your muzzle is pointed. Uh, this is probably one of, in conjunction with another one here, but this is probably one of the most broken firearm safety rules. Um, it's almost never intentional. What usually happens is, is someone gets distracted by something. They're trying to figure out how to turn their sight on, or maybe they can't figure out how to drop a magazine out of a new gun, um, et cetera. And they're fidgeting around with it, and they're so focused in on, on what it is they're doing they forget to pay attention to where their, their muzzle is pointed. Um, that's the number one way I see this rule broken. We're going to talk a little bit about manual of arms, how to use your firearms later, and why that's so important. Um, but this is one of those reasons, is knowing your equipment and how to use it means that you can focus on safety and training when you're actually shooting. So you need to be paying attention to where your muzzle or to where your firearm is pointed at any given time, um, because if it were to accidentally go off, Obviously, a bullet is going to come out of it and potentially hurt someone or damage something. So never point your firearm at anything you're not willing to destroy. The third rule, uh, this is my personal favorite. Firearms uh, are designed in such a way that they don't go off unless you pull the trigger. So if you pull the trigger on a firearm, obviously it's going to go off. If your finger is not on the trigger, you cannot pull the trigger. Um, there's obviously caveats, considerations, you know, you don't want to have something on your shirt get caught in it, etc. But as a general rule of thumb, if you keep your finger straightened off the trigger, the firearm is not going to go off until you actually choose to put your finger on the trigger and pull it. Um, so one of the things that I see a lot with this one is people kind of getting the letter of the law but not the spirit. So I'm actually going to go ahead and enlarge my screen here a little bit so you guys can see a little bit better. If I am holding a, a pistol like this, my finger is straightened off the trigger. Uh, this right here is what's called a high index, and this is what I think everyone should do when they are shooting a firearm, or when they are not shooting a firearm, rather, is to have their index finger up and completely off of the trigger. Um, this ensures a couple things. One, it ensures your finger isn't on the trigger. Two, it's easy for you to tell, based on tactile, you know, the feeling of what you're touching, as well as visually, that your finger is not on the trigger. And in addition, it lets other shooters and people around you at possibly a gun range, et cetera, know that you are practicing good safety. Um, it lets them focus more on what they're doing and once again, just prevents unsafe behavior. So the, the less things people have to focus on at once, the safer everyone can be. So keep your fingers straightened off the trigger until your sights are aligned on target. Um, I'll go into that in a little bit more depth later, um, especially on the terminology, but these are your sights up here. This is your trigger down here. Just keep your finger away from it until you're actually ready to pull the trigger. Like I said a dozen times already, guns don't go bang unless you pull the trigger. So keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are aligned on target and you will be good to go. All right, so the last firearm safety rule and the one that I think a lot of people overlook sometimes is to know your target and what lies beyond it. Um, so we already talked about keeping your firearm pointed in a safe direction. Um, bullets tend to go in a straight line until uh, the either gravity or some outside force affects them. Bullets also go through things. 
Um, they go through walls, they go through wood, they go through paper, obviously. Um, so these are things that you want to know if you are going out and shooting. If you're a new shooter, I would highly recommend finding your local gun range and getting a membership there. Um, main reason being those firearms, uh, those gun ranges are already set up to have a safe place for bullets to impact into. Um, if you are not experienced in it and you just go out in the woods and start shooting, uh, there's a possibility you may miss something. Uh, you could cause a ricochet, which is what happens when bullets bounce off something hard like a rock or a piece of metal. Um, and when they bounce off, they can go flying off in weird directions, uh, and that's very unsafe. So we want to avoid that. Understand that what you're shooting at, your bullet's going through it, and so you need to know what's behind it as well. Um, I actually think this rule should be expanded on. So I also add the caveat of also know what's in front of it, left, right, above, or around your target. Um, as you gain experience, uh, the area you are worried about will become smaller because you'll be more confident and more proficient in putting rounds where you want them. Um, but while you are learning, understand that people make mistakes. Um, this is another reason that gun ranges are great to have. Uh, they don't put a tiny little berm just behind your target. Uh, they're usually huge piles of dirt uh, behind where you're shooting at. So even if you were to completely miss your target, uh, your round would still impact into a safe area. Obviously, though, the goal is to work on you know, getting your rounds to impact where you want them. So just to recap, um, always treat every firearm as if it's loaded. And then we're going to never point our firearm at anything we are not willing to destroy. We're going to keep our fingers straightened off the trigger until our sights are aligned on target. And then last but not least, we're going to know our target and what lies beyond it, above it, left, right, front, all around it. Um, if you take these four firearm safety rules, um, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to memorize them. Um, I'm less worried about you memorizing them word for word um, and more concerned or more uh, expectant that you would remember the meaning behind them. Um, if you truly understand why you're keeping your fingers straightened off the trigger, if you understand why you need to know what's behind your target and what's around it, it's going to be a lot easier to remember and a lot easier to put in practice and just make sure that you, know, you are following good safety rules. Uh, so those are our four firearm safety rules. We'll revisit them a couple times uh, throughout this course, but they are great things to know. Um, so Connor, real quick, to answer your question about uh, old Japanese pistols, <laughs> um, uh, like for example, uh, Japanese Nabu, which was chambered in like some weird 9mm, I think. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later when we talk about maintaining firearms and how important that is to safety, but I will get to that question a little later. All right, so personal protective equipment. Um, there's a couple things that are an absolute must anytime you are shooting firearms. Um, first and foremost of that is hearing protection and eye protection. Well, those are the only two things. Uh, you only have one set of eyes and you only have you know, two, one set of ears. So protect them. Um, I'm way deafer than I probably should be, and that's in large part to in my early days of shooting, I didn't take proper care of my ears. Um, so I would strongly, strongly encourage you guys to get some hearing protection. There's a couple different examples that uh, I have here today just to kind of show you guys. Um, so first and foremost, there's the little ear foam buds. Um, these are very, very cheap. Uh, some places will give them out for free. Other places you can get them for like 50 cents or less. They're very, very cheap. They're disposable. If you lose them, you can grab more. I mean, I grabbed an entire bag of them, and I think this entire bag cost about four bucks. Um, so Something to use, but you do need to understand how to use them properly. Um, they're not something you just stuff in your ear. Uh, they actually need to go down quite a ways into the ear canal. So what I do is, is I roll them between my fingers, so I get a nice narrow gap like that. And then when I stick it into my ear, um, as time goes by, it will expand back out and eventually fill out and totally conform to the ear canal, um, blocking sound. Um, however, sound entering your ear canal is just one area uh, that can cause damage to your, uh, to your hearing. Um, shockwave from a firearm going off can actually vibrate up your jawline um, and affect your inner ear that way without going down the ear canal. So if you can, I highly, highly suggest getting a pair of muffs. Um, these are a set of impact sports. Um, they're electronic hearing protection, so they actually have decibel reduction. But really, any set of muffs, uh, you can get them <clears throat> at your local hardware store, uh, pretty much any sporting goods store. Um, they will have them, uh, so Lowe's, Home Depot, etc. These muffs will actually protect and cover the side of your head. 
Um, so that vibration, that shock wave that I'm talking about, will actually uh, protect from that as well. So just something to keep in mind. Those are your two basic types of hearing protection. They also make non-electronic muffs that will do the same job. Um, so outside of that, um, we also have eye protection. Um, so there's a couple different things that can be considered eye protection. Uh, you are better off with something over your eyes rather than nothing. Um, however, not all eye protection is created equal. Um, if you wear glasses, uh, I would strongly encourage you, especially if you're shooting steel or anything like that, to also get a set of impact rated safety glasses. Um, to wear over the top of your eyeglasses. If you wear contacts or are lucky enough to not need uh, sight correction, pretty much any old pair will do. Um, you can get these cheap disposable ones. Um, they will scratch very easily. They won't last a real long time, but I think this pair uh, costs about $2.50. You can also get something a little bit higher end. Um, so these are, I don't actually remember what brand these are. Um, I can put a link later in here, but these cost about $20. Um, they're very, very clear. They're scratch resistant. Uh, they will last you quite a bit longer. They're also a little more comfy to wear with, uh, with your hearing protection, your muffs. Um, higher end stuff, if you want to be all cool like that, is you can get things like Oakley's, stuff like that. Um, not all sunglasses are impact resistant, so just make sure you are checking the ANSI rating. Um, to make sure that they are in, uh, high enough impact resistance. Um, there's a whole bunch of sites on that. I'll include a link later to, to how to kind of gauge if something is actually impact resistant, but I highly, highly recommend getting some actual safety glasses for when you are shooting. Um, so yeah, Jeff, I'm totally uh, happy to talk a little bit about some fundamentals of aiming. Uh, the main focus of this is safety, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So if we wrap everything up and there's something that I haven't discussed that you'd like to know more about, uh, feel free to just throw those in the comments and we'll cover them all at the end of the live broadcast. All right, so moving on a little bit, let me go ahead and downsize that again. Um, some other things that I think are suggested but not necessarily required um, for safety equipment are things like baseball caps, um, proper shirts, closed-toed shoes. Uh, the reason for the crew neck t-shirt or shirt, something with a high collar, uh, and the baseball cap is mainly to prevent you from getting burned by uh, ejected brass. Uh, so when a firearm goes off, uh, most firearms uh, eject the empty casing after you've expended the powder and fired the bullet, um, which I'll go over later, but it kicks out a piece of brass that's actually pretty warm, um, pretty hot actually. Um, there are videos all over the place of people doing the brass dance, and the reason it's so unsafe is, especially for inexperienced shooters, is it is quite painful, um, and when you have something burning, the, probably the last thing you're thinking about is where your muzzle is pointed or whether or not your finger is on or off of the trigger. Uh, so taking a few simple measures like having a baseball cap on and a high collared shirt to prevent brass from getting anywhere it shouldn't um, is just something you can do to prevent that from even becoming a situation. Um, Closed-toed shoes are good. Uh, I don't know if you've ever stubbed your toe before, but I'm a complete baby when I stub mine. It hurts way more than it should, and usually we react way more than we should. So wear some proper shoes and some proper clothing and just prevent it from being an issue in the first place. All right, so we kind of went over uh, some basics of safety. We covered our four firearm safety rules. Um, I can jump back to them a couple times throughout this course. So if you missed those in the beginning, we will cover them again. Um, we covered some proper uh, protective equipment, personal protective equipment, PPE, or safety equipment for safety and hearing. So we're actually going to jump in a little bit to manual of arms. Um, so manual of arms is a term that comes from the military uh, for law enforcement, uh, but it's also completely applicable to you as a civilian gun owner, um, or maybe just a good refresher if you are uh, in the military or active law enforcement, etc. So my definition, the tech on target definition of manual arms is the knowledge required to operate your firearm. It's pretty simply put. Um, it's understanding a few basic things um, as well as some terminology or terms and link, uh, lingo, et cetera. And I put situational awareness in here, um, which may seem a little out of place for manual of arms. Uh, but the reason I put it in here is to draw attention to what I said a little bit earlier. If you show up to the range, and you already know how to turn your sights on, how to uh, align your sights, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, if you know the basics of how you should grip your pistol, et cetera, 
when you show up to the range, now you're focused on training to shoot. Um, you can focus on training to shoot, and you can focus on safety, and you're not having to distract yourself with these other things that you can safely learn at home. Um, we will talk about dry fire and operating a firearm at home, um, just some safety features for that. But if you can get these things, these manual of arms, uh, down as well as you can before you actually shoot actual ammunition, actual live rounds, um, what you're going to do is give yourself that focus. So it's really important that you know how to operate your firearm. It's important that you read your safety manuals, etc., all of these things uh, before you actually try to use the firearm for the first time. That way you can focus on what's important, safety and training. Um, so kind of talking about this preparedness, uh, planning things out ahead of time. Uh, you've probably heard of the five Ps before. I actually like to call them the seven Ps. Um, and I apologize for the term, but I kind of like it. So I say the seven Ps stand for proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. What that means is, is just like I said, take the time, get to know your firearm, read your manual. YouTube is awesome. There's tons of videos out there. If you look up the model of your firearm, you will be able to find videos on all of this stuff. I'm just going to go ahead and cover some of the basics today. But this is why manual of arms is important. The more you know about your firearm before you actually shoot it, the more you will actually get out of your training and the safer you'll be. All right, so the first one I'm going to go ahead and cover is just the basics. This is universal for any modern firearm. Um, obviously, there's muzzle loaders and shotguns, which are going to be a little bit different. So if you have questions about that, I'm more than happy to try to bring something up for you. Um, but for now, what I'm just going to be talking about is, actually, let me jump to this. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is just parts of, uh, of a round, of a, of a shell. So essentially what you have um, is you've got a couple parts here. Um, first and foremost, the one everyone knows is the bullet. Um, so the bullet's right here. Uh, that's what is actually going to propel down your barrel and go down range um, and hit your target. Then behind that you have the propellant, which the propellant is your gunpowder. Um, it doesn't always look like this. It can look a bunch of different ways, but essentially it's just an explosive material that when ignited expands very, very rapidly. Um, that's what pushes the bullet down the barrel. Then back here you actually have the primer. Um, so the primer is essentially a small contact explosive. So what happens is, is when you pull the trigger on, uh, uh, on your firearm, whether it's a pistol, rifle, etc., uh, some type of metal device is going to be striking the back of the primer which causes it to essentially blow up, very small explosive, which ignites the powder and propels the bullet. Holding all of this together is what's called the casing. Uh, traditionally, they are made out of brass. However, they can also be made out of steel. Um, they can be coated. They can be, uh, I think there might even be some aluminum and polymer ones out there. Uh, essentially, the casing is what holds it all together. And then when you are, when the round is done firing, um, this casing and the spent primer is what actually gets ejected out of the firearm. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about hot brass and why it's important to wear proper clothing. Um, this is what's actually getting kicked out of the firearm after it's done shooting the bullet, and it is very warm, so you do want to be careful with, uh, with what you're wearing and make sure it doesn't burn your skin or anything like that. Uh, firearms are designed to throw this as far away from you as possible. Um, which is great for you. However, just be aware if you're shooting with multiple people, uh, you may be uh, showering them with hot brass. So it's a good idea to pay attention to not just you and where your bullets are going, but also what's going on around you at the shooting range or wherever you may be. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is parts of a firearm. Uh, for example, today I'm just going to be using a, a semi-automatic pistol. Uh, there's also revolvers, things like that. If a revolver is what you own, what you're thinking about buying, or you're really interested in, I'm more than happy to cover that. However, uh, semi-automatic pistols are what I use. So essentially, firearms can be broken down into two major components. Um, the first of those is the frame or the receiver, um, which on a pistol is the bottom part here, and then the slide. And the slide is the top metal part up here, this is every time you pull the trigger, this is going to push back and then go forward again. And that's actually what grabs the next round off the top, which I'll show you in a bit here. Um, but those are your two major parts. You have the slide and you have the frame down here. Um, the slide contains your barrel, which is what you see inside here. So this is the barrel here. 
Um, and then it also contains uh, your, actual, your actual firing mechanism. So in this case, it's a, a striker, it may be a firing pin, a hammer. Um, if you look up and read the manual on your firearm, you can read a little bit about what the differences are on those, but it's really good to understand uh, how, how those work about your specific firearm. If you have questions about specific ones, I will do my best to answer them. Um, down below in the frame or receiver, you have the trigger housing group. So that's all the mechanism required when you pull the trigger to activate your firing mechanism and actually set off the round. Um, in a semi-automatic pistol, you also have uh, your magazine well. So this is uh, what holds your ammunition. And so that's actually where your magazine is going to go. It's going to insert into there. Uh, it also holds your magazine release, which is a button right here that I don't know if you can actually see. But this button right here, when I press it, that's what allows me to pull the magazine out of the firearm. Um, so just a quick recap, you got the slide up top and then the receiver or frame down below. Slide houses your barrel and firing mechanism and then your frame um, or your receiver houses your trigger control group, your magazine release, and then your magazine itself. Um, oh, also really quick, um, your slide is also in pistols anyways, what mounts your sights. Um, so whether they're iron sights like this, um, which is just kind of a manual old school way to do it that works very, very effective, or whether it's a more modern type sight, um, like an electronic red dot, something like this that you might use. In this specific case, I actually have iron sights and an electronic red dot. So just things you can be aware of. Um, those are the basic parts of your firearm. Um, rifles can be a little bit different. Um, if you guys would like to see some rifle parts, uh, feel free to drop a comment. But until then, I'm just going to stick to pistols because they are what most folks are buying. Um, next thing we're going to cover is some types of firearms. Uh, so I already showed you a semi-automatic pistol. Um, I'm not going to show you stuff I don't own today, obviously, because I don't own it. Um, but this is a semi-automatic pistol. So essentially what that means, for those of you who don't know, is every time you pull the trigger, the slide goes back, the slide goes forward, it fired one round, and then it inserted a new round into the chamber, and it does that per one trigger pull. So one trigger pull, one round, reload. Ready for the next shot. When you pull the trigger again, fires another round, cycles, and then puts the new round in the chamber. Um, fully automatic is different. It's you just hold the trigger down and it goes, but with a semi-automatic, it's one round per one trigger pull. Um, this one right here is a striker-fired pistol. And basically what that means is, is it means there is no hammer on the back. It's just a spring and a striker inside. Um, other firearms that you may see, and I apologize, this one's very, very hard uh, to see here. I'll see if I can get it to where you guys can actually see it. It might not be bright enough. There is a tiny little hammer in there. Um, so this is actually a double action only uh, semi-automatic pistol. So what happens is every time the slide goes back, it pushes a hammer back. And then every time you pull the trigger, the hammer flies forward and hits the back of a pin. And that pin pushes forward and ignites the primer on your bullet. Um, so this is a double action semi-automatic semi pistol. There are also single and double action revolvers. Um, if you'd like to know more about those, I'm more than happy to uh, try to pull up some images, etc. I don't actually own any of them. Uh, they're not really my thing. Um, but they are perfectly functional firearms. Um, so those are your basic types of pistols is double action revolver or double action pistols, semi-automatic striker fired pistols, and then you have your single and double action revolvers. Um, there's also rifles, shotguns, etc. So I've just got a couple quick examples here just to kind of show you guys in general. Um, so this is just a simple 22 bolt action rifle. Uh, bolt action rifles are not semi-automatic because every time you pull the trigger, bang, you then have to pull open the bolt pull it back, which ejects the old casing. And then in the case of this, it's a single shot. So you'd have to set a new round in there, close the bolt again, and then you're ready to fire again. Um, so that's the basics of bolt action. Some bolt actions do have magazines where you will be able to put multiple rounds in. And every time you pull the bolt, it'll kick out the old one and then strip the new one off and put it into the chamber. Um, this is an AR-15. This is a semi-automatic uh, rifle. It's got a hammer inside that you can't actually see. Um, but essentially, same idea here. Um, you've got a trigger. So just like on the semi-automatic pistols, every time I pull this trigger, there is a, a bolt carrier group in here that's going to slide back. Um, well, it's going to send the round off. Then it's 
going to slide back, push forward again. That'll eject the old casing and put the new one uh, into the chamber. So another example of semi-automatic, but in a rifle format. So those are your basic kinds. Um, you've got shotguns as well. Like I said, they operate by the same basic principles um, uh, as far as rifles and pistols are concerned. There's a whole bunch of different types out there, and there's a lot of strange variations of all of them. Um, so it's not something I can cover everything today, just kind of a quick high-level overview. Uh, like I said, if you do have specific questions, drop a comment. Um, if you're watching this afterwards, uh, YouTube is your friend. I may say that a couple times. There is tons and tons of information on YouTube. Uh, just get out and start hunting through. The more you know, the better off you'll be. Um, so real quick, uh, talking about manual of arms a little bit, kind of just went through some stuff that was just general knowledge about it. But getting into the actual manual of arms, um, there's a couple things that you will need to know that's good to know ahead of time. Uh, first of those is how to go ahead and actually load your pistol um, or load your firearm in general. So today I'm actually going to be using snap caps. Uh, they are fake ammunition. Um, they've got a fake primer in the back. I don't know if that can focus. Um, but then they are red and they are just all plastic with a little spring inside. Um, this is just to show for example, um, because I don't want to use any actual live ammunition when you're just practicing. Um, these are things you can get. They cost about a dollar a piece, so they're kind of spendy. Um, but if you would like to practice more at home, um, I will try to remember to include some links as these as well. Uh, so if you're loading a magazine, so this is a magazine for a Glock, 19, oh, Glock 17 actually, um, essentially all you're going to do is you've got your magazine body here, and then you have your base plate, and the base plate is holding up a spring that's inside of here, and the spring is pushing up this orange bit here. It won't always be orange, but that moves up and down, and that's called your follower. So to load a magazine, all you have to do is push around in from the front until you get your follower down, and it will catch on these little metal flanges that you maybe can't quite see, these right here, those are called the feed lips. And so you want to catch the back of the round on those feed lips and then push the round until it's all the way to the back. That's how you load the first one. And then the second one, um, I like to push the round down with my finger here. And you just push it down over the top and push it back in until it catches and then slide it into place. Um, so this gets easier with practice. There's also tools out there that will help you load magazines um, depending on how you want to do it. But essentially, you just push down, push back, and then you've got them loaded. Um, it is important. You want to make sure that the round is all the way back. So if you can see, this one's a little bit forward here. You want to make sure it's all the way back. Otherwise, you can get a magazine stuck in your firearm or cause stoppages or issues. Um, it is something to make sure you know how to do. It's pretty basic, but it will help you shoot a little bit better. Um, so in order to load a firearm, First thing we're going to do um, is go ahead and just do a load. Let's actually do a load on a uh, closed slide here. Um, so magazine equals source of ammunition. Slide equals way that you put ammunition in the gun. Uh, so step one to load a semi-automatic pistol is to actually go ahead and insert your magazine until it clicks. Um, let me go ahead and make this screen a little bit bigger here. Um, so after you've put the magazine in, uh, this firearm is technically loaded, but it's not chambered. Um, so what you need to do in order to actually put a round in the chamber, the chamber is just the back of the bullet. That's what holds the, or back of the barrel, sorry. Uh, that's what holds the round and prepares it to fire. Um, you're going to need to pull the slide back and then let it go. Um, one of the common newbie mistakes that I see on using firearms is people tend to baby the firearm. They, they treat it very nicely. Um, this slide here, if it's even a little bit out of place, the firearm will not fire. Um, it's just a safety mechanism that's built into these firearms. So it's important that when you're loading, unloading, operating, make sure you're pointed in a safe direction. Um, but obviously, uh, you need to be rough, if nothing else. Um, violence of action is what some people call it. So you can either do an overhand grab on a semi-automatic pistol. So that's coming over the top here. Make sure you keep your hand clear of this area here. Um, as you open and close the firearm, you could get a good pinch in there. So make sure your hand's clear. Um, you can also go ahead and turn it sideways. And if you turn it sideways, you can grab it this way, um, like this. So it's slingshot. But regardless, whether you're pushing this hand forward or pulling back with this hand, 
Once you have it all the way back, just let it go. They are designed to close on their own. So it's just pull it back, let it go. And now what happened is, if you can see there, I've actually got a round chambered into the, uh, the back or into the chamber, back of the barrel there. So when you do it, pull it back, let it go. Um, so if that were a live round and if I pulled the trigger, um, pulled the trigger, the gun goes bang, bullet goes down, and what's going to happen is, is that other round is going to eject out and the slide will grab the next round off the top of the magazine. So that's how it works in a semi-automatic pistol is zoom, and you've got a new round chambered. So that was loading um, a firearm. The other thing that can happen is, is what's called the need for a tactical reload, or um, there's a bunch of other names for it. Tactical is just kind of what I call it. What that means is, is I'm on the range. I've fired a couple of rounds. Um, I'm not ready to be done shooting, so there's no need to completely unload it, uh, but I do want to top off, put a fresh magazine in. And so all that involves is pulling out your old magazine. So remember your magazine release is on the side of your firearm there. And then take a new magazine with the ammunition in it and just go ahead and insert it till it clicks. And I don't have to operate the slide or anything because I still have a round in the chamber from my first magazine. Um, so once again, an admin reload is just press the button to drop the mag. Take your new magazine with ammunition in it and push it up till it clicks. So that's your tactical reload. Um, when you're all done shooting for the day, it's important to do an admin unload. Um, the reason we distinguish between admin and tactical gets a little bit more into the self-defense type training uh, that we tend to do with our classes. Um, but for just new shooters who are just starting out, if you are continuing to shoot, it's considered tactical. You are keeping the firearm loaded and ready to go. If you are done shooting, maybe you're taking a bathroom break, maybe you are going home for the day, you need to completely unload the firearm. Um, so with semi-automatic pistols, there is a very specific order this needs to be done in, and it needs to be done in this order every single time. Uh, so step one is to remove the source of ammunition. So drop your magazine out, whether it has rounds in it or not, you can set that aside. Um, however, this is still not unloaded because we still have a round in the chamber. Um, this is the number one cause of negligent discharges, is someone drops the magazine, forgets to remove the round that's actually in the chamber, and then if they're not following their firearm safety rules and they pull the trigger or point it in an unsafe direction, they forget that they actually have a live round in here. Um, so step number two, so step one is to pull the magazine. Step number two is to go ahead and rack the slide to get that round to come out. You can actually watch it come out. There it goes. That's step two. Step three, four, and five are to check it again. Um, what I usually do is I go rack, rack, so that was steps three and four. I just racked it twice to ensure. Um, occasionally what happens is, is a round will get stuck in the chamber, and when you rack the slide, it won't actually pull it out. But if you do it three times properly, it should pull it out. Um, what you can then do is go ahead and do a visual inspection. So to lock a slide to the rear, um, if you see this little tab here, it pushes up towards the slide. If I push that up, let's see if I can do this upside down. Nope, I'm going to have to do it this way. If I push that slide up on something like this, go ahead and push it up and pull the slide back, you will actually see that go into the little notch there, and it will catch the slide. So there's a little notch in your slide here that catches the slide release. Um, that will lock this open. Now, I always do a visual inspection down into the chamber to make sure nothing's in there. Uh, some people also like to do a tactile one. They'll actually reach in and feel. It's totally okay, just be really careful if you're putting your finger in here. If this were to slam shut on it, it's not gonna permanently maim you, but it will not feel great. Um, so do that inspection in there, make sure you know what's going on inside of the chamber. Um, then the next thing you can do once you've confirmed it's all unloaded, is you can either pull back on the slide, or you can use your slide release. If you just pull back, it will release, or if you press this down, it will send the slide forward. Um, you know this is unloaded at this point, but we are still treating it as if it's a loaded firearm. And at that point, you can go ahead and secure it in your range bag, holster, whatever that may be, um, to transport it back from the gun range. So that's the really quick basics on uh, an admin load, uh, a tactical load, or topping off, and then an admin unload. The big important thing, uh, the most important thing uh, beyond the safety rules there, is that admin unload. Remove the source of the magazine, 
check three times that there's nothing in the chamber by racking the slide. The first time you should see around, the second and third time you should not. Um, and then that last step of lock it back and go ahead and inspect the chamber. Um, so one quick thing that I did want to show you guys really quick um, in order to test uh, that the chamber is empty. Some people do have issues getting the slide to lock back. Um, so this one does add quite a few steps, and it's not my preferred method, but if for whatever reason you just cannot get the slide to lock back, um, you can use this. Uh, so first off, grab a magazine and make sure that it is empty, that there are no rounds in it. And if you go ahead and insert that magazine into the firearm and pull the slide all the way back, it will lock open on its own uh, because you have an empty magazine in there. So once you've done that, now you have to start over again. Step one, drop the magazine. Step two, we're just going to visually and maybe tactically inspect that nothing is in the chamber um, since we can already see in there. And at that point, you know that the firearm is unloaded. Still following our safety rules, we can go ahead and secure that firearm wherever we need it to go. So that's the basics on admin loads, tactical reloads, and admin unloads. Um, obviously, that admin unload is very, very important. Uh, you do not want to be transporting loaded firearms, especially if you don't have your concealed carry license um, and have a basic understanding of how to do that. So make sure you practice those at home. I highly, highly recommend, if you can, um, purchase some snap, camps, snap caps. Um, if you cannot, just go ahead and pretend. Walk through those steps a couple times. Um, watch this video a couple times. Practice it. Obviously, make sure there is absolutely no actual ammunition um, around when you are handling firearms, if you're just practicing at home. All right, um, so just kind of a quick overview. We talked about manual of arms. Uh, all we discussed was really admin loads, uh, tactical reloads, and admin unloads. Those are the three big ones for new shooters out there. Um, there is a wealth of other things that can be covered under this. I've already talked about knowing how to operate any kind of sights you might have, um, knowing how to find the magazine release on your firearm. I showed you ones that had button magazine releases. Um, there are also firearms, like if you have the H&K models, some of the FNNs, instead of a button, it's going to be a lever on the side of the trigger guard that you'll push down. Um, that's how you'll get that magazine removed. Uh, maybe a button somewhere else on the firearm. This is why it's so important to read your user, user manual and make sure you know what's going on with that. Um, so just some quick uh, final things on manual of arms. Knowledge equals confidence, which is very important. Um, confidence is what lets you build proficiency. Um, by proficiency, I mean going out to the range and not being distracted by basic things like how to remove a magazine, how to adjust your sights, lets you focus on training and safety. Uh, this is something that I think gets overused a little bit, but I do think it's very, very true. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Now, there is no need to go out and be what I call Oscar operator immediately uh, with practice and training that can come, um, will come. Uh, you will improve if you train, but it's important to remember that following safety is a lifestyle. Uh, it's not just a test that you pass and then you're good for all of the time. It's something that you need to be consciously thinking about at all times. Um, so this is one of my favorite things, uh, or least favorite things actually, is time does not equal proficiency. Um, what some shooters get caught up in is the idea that because they have been shooting for a long time, that they are experts at safety. Um, and while that may be true, if you were shooting and training and paying active attention to it, um, it is not necessarily true if you were doing incorrect things that entire time. Um, I have a relative who likes to say practice makes permanent, and I really love that. Um, if you practice the wrong way, you will permanently do it the wrong way. Uh, if you practice the right way, you will permanently do it the right way. So safety is a lifestyle. Just make sure it's something you guys continually practice as you start down or continue on the road of owning firearms. It's, it's very, very important, uh, both for your safety and for other folks. Um, so covering manual of arms, like we said, uh, we kind of talked about how to do specific things with the firearms. Um, what we're going to talk now about is firearm safety in practice, in reality. Uh, what we're talking about today is how to take those skills um, and how to use those in places where you are not necessarily shooting the firearm. Uh, this could be your home, this could be your car, this could be concealed carry, etc., things like that. Um, this is something that is just important to do. So what I use for this uh, is something called situational awareness colors or Cooper's colors. 
Um, if you're curious about who Cooper is, uh, look him up. Uh, Colonel Cooper invented the four firearm safety rules. He invented these situational colors. Uh, he was kind of the father of modern firearms training. Uh, but these are really useful to have and not just for defensive or combat situations, which is what they were actually invented for. Um, these are just good examples to have for living in a home with firearms. Um, so there's a couple things here, actually. There is white, yellow, orange, and red. Um, so white means you are not paying attention to anything that's going on around you. You're not really, um, oh, whoops, let me cover this really quick. Uncover that, sorry. Um, this is when you are just kind of clueless to your surroundings on things. Um, it's possible to be white condition in some areas of your life and not in others, um, but for the sake of firearms in your home, white is where you absolutely don't want to be. Um, yellow is practice. Um, so I'm going to define a little bit here real quick what the difference between practice and training is in my mind. Um, practice is living a lifestyle, uh, choosing to continually and always be uh, practicing safety, practicing awareness, etc. Um, training, while it includes practice, is a specific skill. Uh, the example I like to give, if you have children in your home and that's one of the reasons you're concerned about firearm safety, um, Practice is paying attention to what your children are doing and what they are getting into, just kind of a general awareness of it, and you practice that every single day as a good parent. Uh, training would be something more along the lines of knowing infant CPR. It's a very specific skill that you have to train and practice at, and I'll explain here in a second why that's so important. Uh, so white is where we don't want to be. Um, it's clueless. Yellow is practice. That's that idea of I'm aware of what's going on around me. Um, it's not paranoia. I know a lot of folks may consider it to be paranoia. It's actually more along the lines of just kind of a, a base awareness uh, is the best way to describe it. So for example, I like to give the example if you are a parent uh, with a child, one of the scariest things I've been told that a parent can hear in a home with a toddler is nothing. Um, if you hear nothing, you have to assume that they've gotten into something that they shouldn't. And so you go from yellow, which is just kind of being aware of what's going on, to orange. Um, orange is where you are making an assessment of whether or not this is a situation that you actually need to do something about. <clears throat> um, the reason I put manual of arms here on orange is because this is where knowledge is so important. Uh, if you don't know enough about the subject, you are not going to be able to make a good decision on whether or not it's an emergency or not. So the more you know about things, uh, the better. In the case of firearms, this is really useful. A uh, quick example to interject in my other example is if you're out in public and you see another person carrying a firearm, if you are very well versed and practiced in firearm safety, you can use your knowledge about firearm safety and et cetera to make a judgment call as to whether or not that person is someone you need to be worried about. Um, but back to my example of the toddler, um, you know your toddler, you know what they get into, you are not hearing any noise coming from them, so you go into this orange state. And orange is where you're assessing. So you're searching through the home, trying to find your kid and figure out what, if anything, that they've gotten into. Um, once you find them, let's say you find them and all they're doing is, is they snuck a cookie. You know, they weren't supposed to have a cookie. Well, now you've assessed that, you know they're not in any actual danger, you can step back down to that yellow level um, and not be worried anymore. Uh, but for example, if you were to find them and uh, you know they, heaven forbid, had choked on something or gotten tangled up in something, at that point, it's a real emergency. Um, so that's actually where uh, the other step comes in uh, that's not actually included in, in Cooper's colors or situational awareness colors, and that's the color black. Um, so black is panic. Um, where red is an emergency that you are handling as calmly as you can, um, black is blind panic. Um, black is something that you absolutely need to avoid at all costs. Um, when you are in a black mindset, you are not able to plan, you are not able to think clearly, you are just consumed by fear, and you will most likely make uh, bad decisions that will uh, compound or make the situation worse. Um, it's very difficult to get out of a black stage, but it is possible. Um, one thing I do want to note here, though, it's very, very possible to go from yellow to black or orange to black or red to black. Um, but when you are coming out of black, the only place you can actually go in reality is all the way back down to yellow. Um, you need to reset, be aware of what's going on, then go through the troubleshooting process again, and then get to red and try to stay there without increasing panic. 
Um, so this is just kind of a quick high-level overview of these, but the reason they're important is um, talking about firearm safety, especially in your home and especially with children, um, also guests, people that maybe aren't around firearms on a regular basis, um, is it's important to not panic, to understand where your firearms are, what you are doing with them, how you're storing them, um, et cetera. So what about your kids? And don't assume others' knowledge. Basically what this boils down to is if you have firearms in your home, it is your territory and it is your responsibility. Uh, it's your responsibility to ensure that safe storage practices take place. It's your responsibility to ensure that anyone and everyone with access to your firearms, uh, whether that's your wife, um, older children, um, et cetera, that they have the proper safety training. I will obviously leave that up to you guys as to who you decide gets access. Um, but the important thing is, is that you have a way to actually determine who has access to your firearms. Um, so the way you can do that is by balancing or walking the storage balance. The balance is what I like to call it. Um, what I say is it is up to a shooter to find the balance between safety and accessibility. Um, so this touches a little bit on self-defense, and if that's not really your thing, you can tune out for a second. Uh, just take it as safety is important, good safe storage is important. Um, but if you are interested in self-defense, uh, deep storage or some type of locked safe can make it more difficult to get to your firearm in the case that you actually need it. Um, especially if you have children in, et cetera, things like that in the home, you have a bunch of options to secure your firearm, um, but just be aware that you may have to play the balance between safety and accessibility if self-defense is one of your primary concerns. Um, so safe storage is essentially just restricting access uh, to your firearms. So there's a couple different things that are out there. Um, you have varying levels of hardness, um, and then you have varying levels of obscurity, and you can actually combine these two together. Um, so for example, something on the very, very obscure, um, but not very secure side of things, or not very hard side of things, would be putting guns in a sock drawer. Uh, your children, I can guarantee you, will find it in a sock drawer eventually, um, so that is not a good place to, to store your firearms. Uh, as well, in the worst case scenario, that someone were to break into your home, um, even if you weren't there, um, robbers, thieves, things like that, they know that's where people like to store stuff, so it's going to be some of the first places they are looking. But just a couple examples of how you can secure your firearms at home. Um, this is a cable lock, uh, so you lock your slide back and then you run the cable down the magazine well, so obviously you can't have the firearm loaded to do this. Um, these cable locks are incredibly cheap, it doesn't stop someone from walking away with your firearm, unfortunately. Um, but they're cheap. They're under $5. Um, th if you're in Washington State, Schland County at least, um, you can actually go down to your sheriff's department and get one of these for free. Um, so that's one option you have. Another option you have is just a hardened safe. So this is just a really basic uh, firearm safe. I'll open it up here so you can see. Um, essentially just the firearm sits inside here. And the nice thing about these is they actually come with a hardened cable that you can lock into the case. Um, and then you can secure this cable around something permanent, um, maybe a pipe or whatever, um, but it gives you an option to actually lock the case to prevent someone from easily just walking away uh, with your secured firearm. Um, so those are your two cheap options. That case probably costs about $19.99. You can get it at most sporting goods stores. Um, then you have a couple other options. If you want to get higher up in the hardening levels, uh, you can have gun cabinets. Uh, gun cabinets are, are not hardened, so pretty much anyone could get through the side of them with a sawzall, et cetera. Um, but they do stop just the, the passerby. Um, a child, a guest poking around, et cetera, they are going to stop them from having access to your firearms. Uh, if you want a little bit more security, you can get a full-blown gun safe. Um, I will warn you, they're very heavy. They can weigh 400 pounds or more. Um, they are also not as secure as people think they are, but they are the most secure option um, as far as off-the-shelf security for your firearms are concerned. Um, so you've got safes, you've got gun cabinets, uh, you've got small, you know, little portable gun safes like this. This is what I use when I travel. Um, and then you have, you know, obviously your cable locks or just obscurity. I know there's hidden shelves, et cetera, all of that out there. Um, what it's going to come down to is you as the gun owner looking at your situation, whether or not you've got kids, how many guests you have, et cetera, knowing the people that are in your home, um, making sure they are trained in safety, and then deciding on what you think is the best solution for you as far as security is concerned.
All right, um, so moving on a little bit, um, just a quick thing on concealed carry. Um, concealed carry is another form of securing your firearm. Um, in fact, I think it's one of the most secure forms of securing a firearm, and that's carrying it on your person. Um, this isn't for everybody, um, and it's a personal choice. There's a lot of responsibility and con uh, additional training that is required if you're going to choose to conceal carry, uh, but it is an option that, my opinion, is the most secure just because it's on your person and you are always aware of where you are, um, at least most of the time, hopefully, if you are carrying. Um, so that's all I'm going to touch on it. It's out there, something you can look into. Different states have different laws, so just make sure you're aware um, there are laws in most states requiring you to apply for a permit before you can actually go ahead and uh, carry a loaded pistol on your body. Um, real quick, I wanted to talk about holsters. So a lot of firearms have uh, safety features, and depending on what they are, they may be a manual safety. Um, so for example, on this firearm here, there is a little switch in the back here. So when the firearm is closed, if you move that switch up, this firearm is now on safe. This is what's considered a manual or external safety. It's actually a switch or a button on a firearm that I need to activate, and it either stops the hammer from falling or it prevents me from pulling the trigger. Um, that's one type of safety. Uh, the other types of safeties that you'll see on a lot of modern pistols is there is no manual safety. There is no external switch or button that prevents you from pulling the trigger. Um, they have what's called automatic safeties or you know, internal safeties. There is, I believe, five, six safeties on the Glock model pistols that prevent it from going off by any means other than pulling the trigger. Um, some firearms, if the safety is not engaged, they are at a risk if they were dropped. Um, they could go off without pulling the trigger. Uh, but firearms that have no external or ma manual safety have safety features built into them, so the only way it will go off is if you pull the trigger. Um, why that's so important to understand and why holsters are important is holsters are what I consider to be external safety features. Um, so there are a lot of holsters out there that you can get, and a lot of first-time gun owners buy them. Um, they're just generic, one-size, kind of fits-all holsters. I do not consider those safe. Um, reason being is, is you want a holster that is built specifically for your firearm. It has some type of retention. This one actually clicks into place. As you can see, it's got complete plastic covering of your entire trigger guard, both front and back. There's no way to get anything inside of the trigger guard there. And that acts as your safety. Basically what that means is as long as the firearm is holstered, no one can pull the trigger. And the only time you would pull the trigger is if you were unholstering the firearm in order to shoot it. Um, so just a quick note on that. If you are planning on shooting from a holster, uh, make sure you get a holster that is specifically made for your model of firearm. Um, also, just some general safety and practice is know the law. Um, there is state law. There's federal law. There's county law. There's all these laws. Um, designed to do whatever it may be for firearms, um, that something that you as a firearms owner should be aware of. Um, an example I have is I have a friend who a couple years ago uh, found a firearm in his uh, recently deceased relative's home and was unsure of what to do with it, and he ended up just giving it to a neighbor. Um, was just trying to be nice, but wasn't aware of the laws surrounding it. Um, it's actually illegal to just hand a firearm to someone like that without some kind of paperwork in a case like that. There's a whole bunch of nuance, so if you live in Washington State, uh, be sure to check out uh, a couple of the laws that we'll talk a little bit later about. Uh, do some time, do some reading, make sure you are um, following the law so as to not cause additional difficulties for yourself as a firearms owner. A um, couple things here that we're going to cover real quick is just one more thing, safety in practice. Uh, so we talked a little bit about old pistols a little earlier on. Um, this is something that I think is just as important to safety as the four firearm safety rules and is considered to be part of your manual of arms. Um, I've said in the safety rules that guns do not go bang unless you pull the trigger, and that's true so long as your firearm is in good working order. Um, so I put a little note in here about maintenance. Um, obviously, we want to keep rust down. Uh, we want to keep dirt and things out of our firearms. Um, if we do get them in there while we're shooting, we want to make sure we clean them out when we are done shooting. Um, we want to worry about things like lead buildup in your barrel. Um, you want to make sure that your barrel is clean and has no obstructions. 
those are all things that you want to make sure you're aware of while you are training, shooting, practicing this safe lifestyle. Um, keep it in good working order, and then that way the safety rules will actually work. Um, if you've got a firearm with broken safety rules or broken safety features or broken parts on it, um, all of a sudden those safety rules start to fly out the window because uh, they are designed around this idea that you have a good working firearm. Uh, once again, this is why it's important to read your entire user manual. Make sure you know how to operate, load, unload. Um, there will also be sections in there about cleaning your firearm. Um, so I don't actually know if I have one here. I do. So yeah, user manuals are usually just a little book that comes with it. Um, if you kind of glance through them, there'll be a glossary. It will show you all of the parts of the firearm um, and then give you a glossary of where to go as far as cleaning and maintenance is concerned. So make sure you read that. Um, Another thing, I've said it already, YouTube is your friend and read your owner's manual. So this one I know might not be popular with everybody, um, but I want to talk a little bit about civic responsibility. Uh, this is specifically aimed at those of you who own firearms or are planning on buying a firearm for the purpose of self-defense. Um, you owe it as a, a firearms owner in order to be a responsible firearms owner. Uh, you owe it to be prepared as you possibly can be for the eventuality that you would possibly need to use your firearm, obviously with the goal of hoping to never have to. Um, so this is a quote from General Mattis that I really, really like, and it's, be polite, be professional, and have a plan to kill everyone you meet. I don't really necessarily mean that, but at the same time, I kind of do. Um, and let me explain that really quick. Um, training to potentially use a firearm against another human being is a very, very serious matter um, and something you should not take on lightly without very carefully thinking it over and deciding if that's a responsibility that you accept. Um, human life is precious. Uh, there are people out there who intend bad things, and there are people out there who are willing to stand up to that. It's not for everyone, and I don't expect everyone to do it. But if you do choose to carry that responsibility, when I say have a plan to kill everyone you meet. What I don't mean is to sit around and fantasize about how you would kill someone, um, but if you're going to carry concealed, it is very, very important to think through situations that you might be in. Um, if you had to use your firearm in self-defense against another person, you can't zero in and get tunnel vision on just that. You also need to be very aware of, you know, is where do I spend my time? Maybe it's at a workplace. Maybe I have people around me. Uh, maybe there would be people sitting by the door where uh, a potential bad guy might be coming in through. Those are all things you need to think through um, so you're prepared for the eventuality if it does happen, um, that you're not just spraying bullets blindly, um, that you've got the training and you're prepared for the situations that you may find yourself in. Um, those are really, really, really important. Um, the first two, be polite, be professional, those are incredibly important. Um, whether you've already purchased a firearm, um, own several, or are planning on purchasing a firearm, you do represent the firearms community now. Uh, if you choose to carry concealed or keep one in your home for self-defense, um, being polite, being professional is not only going to potentially help you later. Um, if you do have to use your firearm in self-defense, there will be a court case about it, um, but it will also just uh, ensure that people understand that the majority of firearms owners are actually polite and courteous individuals. So just be polite, be professional, and have a plan to handle any situation you might encounter. Um, is probably a better way to say that, but this one gets people's attention. So I've talked a little bit about it already. Um, understand the societal responsibility. If you choose to own a firearms for self-defense, um, please, please get proper training. Um, firearms are only as good as the people behind them. Um, if you have absolutely no training, um, when it comes down to the wire, you are possibly in that black or red level of uh, situational awareness colors we talked about. Uh, if you don't have that training ahead of time, uh, you could potentially be more of a danger than if you potentially be more of a danger um, than, than the thing causing the issue in the first place. So be trained, be aware of what's going on, know your own limitations. Um, and just really get out and know as much about this as you can before you make that responsible choice. Um, talked about laws a little bit. Uh, this screen right here, I will actually go ahead and include a link to some of these a little bit later. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. Just be aware that there are laws out there um, pertaining to ownership and carrying of firearms. It's not something, it's not the wild, wild west uh, like a lot of people think it is. You don't just get to strap a gun on and do whatever you want. Um, you do need to represent and be a good law-abiding citizen. So make sure you are aware of those because uh, it would suck to get in trouble 
um, just because you weren't aware of something, that is not an excuse, legally speaking. Um, so make sure you check that out. Uh, these specifically are for Washington State, but if you live elsewhere, there are other things as well to check out. So um, kind of wrapped everything up. Uh, we talked about our safety rules, and we talked about how important they are. They exist. They're fail-safes and checks and balances for each other. Those four firearm safety rules, which will be on the next slide again, it's what I'm going to leave the video on, um, are really, really important for you guys uh, to know as people are around or handling firearms. Um, if you're shooting firearms, obviously you need to make sure you have the proper uh, uh, PPE safety gear. You only have one set of ears and one set of eyes, so you should go ahead and protect those and take the best care of them you can. Uh, practice requires living the lifestyle. We talked a little bit about that. Safety isn't something where you take a test and you're good. It means that you need to be constantly aware of firearm safety when you are around firearms, when you're handling them, um, just something you need to pay attention to. It's absolutely paramount. Um, so it is a lifestyle. It's something you'll do forever as long as you are around firearms. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the situational awareness colors. Uh, I talked about how important when you're in orange, that assessment level. Uh, knowledge is required for good assessment. Uh, the more you know about a subject, if there is an emergency surrounding it, the better decision you will be able to make on whether or not it is an actual emergency or not. Um, but if it is an actual emergency, control of that situation requires skills. So in the case of firearms, um, whether it's a potential breach of access to your firearms or whether it's a self-defense scenario, the more training and skills you have developed around that, um, the better you will be able to stay in that red zone and keep from slipping into that black panic uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, I summed it up with there is absolutely no substitute for training. Um, it's important to have your knowledge, your manual of arms, and your safety down. Those are all baseline things you need to have. Uh, but in order to truly be a responsible firearms owner, you need to go out and train for what your intended purpose is. If all you're doing is going to be shooting competitions, recreational shooting, hunting, etc., train for that. Uh, make sure you know how to properly carry a firearm in the woods. Make sure you know how to uh, properly unload and load your rifle, whatever pistol, whatever your choice may be a firearm. And then obviously for self-defense, there's a whole realm of training you need, whether it's uh, medical training or um, you know, tactics training or clearing homes, clearing houses, etc. I said that one twice. Uh, but there are a wealth of skills that you will need, and depending on what you are going to use a firearm for, it's very, very important that you go out and get that training. So I'm just going to go ahead and end on the universal firearm safety rules. I'll leave them up here. Um, if you wanted to screenshot them, this video will be posted to Tech on Target uh, later today. Um, if you have family members, people who couldn't make it today that you'd like to show them this video, I do think it's a really, really great opportunity to get out um, some safety training out into the world. It's definitely something we need. And I think it's one of the most important things. It's the baseline you need to know before you can begin anything else. Uh, so for those of you who didn't uh, catch the whole thing, thank you for what you did catch. Like I said, it'll be posted later. I'm David Belmont from Tech on Target. Uh, just a quick cl couple closing things here. Um, I did have a question about uh, sites that I'm more than happy to cover when we're wrapped up. Um, we've got classes up uh, currently with COVID-19, everything like that. Um, all of our classes out through June are canceled at the moment. Um, but if you are interested, if you're in the Pacific Northwest and you'd like to uh, take, uh, I believe it's a rifle class in June, uh, COVID-19 is actually a code you can use on the website right now. That's 35% off any class. Uh, and the first two people who sign up for a course are actually going to go ahead and get a free Feral Concepts Slingster. Um, it's my favorite rifle sling. It's what I use on all of my ARs. It's, it's a great thing to do. Um, but training is super, super important to me um, that everyone who owns firearms gets it. So if you look through my site, maybe you saw this video, you've seen my other stuff, and uh, you just don't think I'm a real good fit for you, uh, please still shoot me an email, Facebook message, Instagram. I will do my best to get you in touch with an instructor that you think drives better than you, or sorry, drives better with you than me. Uh, my primary goal is to get training um, and responsible gun ownership on the rise, and it's just something that I think is super important. So even if it's not with me, I want to get you guys some good training. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for sticking it out and going through this with me. I know I went a little bit over on time, but I really appreciate it. Um, and please, 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 if you know someone who owns firearms, uh, show them this video. It doesn't matter if they've already been trained or not. Uh, we can always use a refresher on safety. 
So thanks, and I hope you guys have a good one. Um, at this point, if uh, you were just here for the safety, you can jump off. I'm going to talk a little bit about aligning sites because I know I had a question on that. Um, 